Morning, everybody. Um, I've been asked to uh, talk with you about how to build an international team from New Zealand, but I have a declaration right up front. I'm actually going to segue straight out of that and talk or actually about culture rather than team. And there's a very specific reason for that, which I'll get to in a moment. Uh, the unfortunate thing about choosing to talk about culture over team is I'm rather obsessed with the word culture. And so I just want to make sure that I don't overplay my enthusiasm for you in terms of receptivity. So I just need a little bit of feedback before we can get started, if that's okay. What I'd love to know is how many of you see that organizational culture and the culture within your company or within your business has a significant role to play in terms of your growth or your aspiration or your delivery on purpose or your delivery on brand promise. And I'm going to get some feedback from you in a moment because what I'd like you to do is kind of rate it in three different levels. So in a moment, I'm going to ask for people to vote for three if you see that as just a non-negotiable, like without the cultural component, you're just not going to get to or become the thing that you desire to do. Right, so it's an absolute must have. Great, okay, good, good. That's the overwhelming majority of the room. Don't, need, don't even need to do the rest of the survey. Thank you, that's so much. And I'm so relieved because I had nothing else planned to talk to you about, so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before I get started, I'm gonna kind of sound quite convinced about what I'm talking about. And I need to sort of explain a little bit about why that is. Uh, the first thing is, and the reason I've selected to talk about culture rather than team is there's a very, very important distinction to make between the two. And I find a lot of business people without realizing don't separate these two things out. So what I'd like to suggest to you is that teams are for something, right? So they're for activating sales and marketing, they're for activating operations, they are for delivering on this objective within this time frame. they are for a contribution or an impact to the customer. So teams are designed, if you like, for function and delivery of. Culture, on the other hand, is what we call from something. And that sounds like, just to play on words, there's a significant difference between those two, right? So if you think about what are we here for, it's to do X. If you look at the culture from where that doing is coming from, that changes the intent behind it. And so what I find is a lot of organizations, and tell me if you can relate to this at all, refer to culture often in quite simplistic manners. So they'll even describe it as the way we do things around here. Have you come across that phrase in your career? Culture is the way we do things around here. And it's not a bad kind of starting place to kind of investigate, unpack, and explore what culture is all about. But what it suggests to you is a far more effective way of actually starting to think about culture is not the way we do things around here, but rather why we do it this way. So again, that's where are you coming from with your perspective and your intent when you go about the doing of so just those subtle distinctions alone enable us to kind of get a deeper sort of understanding of the role culture is potentially playing in your business and how to start to think about culture effectively. So just need to declare something up front, and I, I kind of need to do this because even from conversations this morning, people said, oh, you're the, uh, the corporate anthropologist, and they started asking me questions about pottery and ancient bones, etc. <laughs> so I just need to make a very, very clear distinction before we get started. Uh, anthropologists regularly get confused with archaeologists, right? So the Indiana Jones character, we're all familiar, we all look old enough to remember those movies. Okay, so they're archaeologists, I'm an anthropologist. A uh, really simple distinction between the two is anthropologists study living cultures, archaeologists study dead cultures. Right. So if you ever turn up to a Better by Design event and Jeremy's invited an archaeologist uh, to talk, it means your industry is in serious trouble. <laughs> right. And you're probably better to spend your time working on your CV. Uh, one other thing, distinction you should understand about the difference between these two is most anthropologists, not all, but most anthropologists actually wanted to be archaeologists. We just didn't have the grades. Uh, so archaeologists are ridiculously intelligent human beings, kind of multi-skilled. Uh, anthropologists, not so much. So if you can just lower your expectations for this talk, then we'll probably be able to get on well and work well together. So what do anthropologists basically do? Well, as I said at the beginning of the talk, we actually study culture. And even understanding kind of what that word means, where it comes from, how culture forms, how it's structured, how it functions, is a really complex conversation, right? So we literally have four to five years, maybe six to eight years at university studying one word. What is culture? And the challenge I find in organizations is the biggest mistake almost that organizations make with it is they absolutely oversimplify culture. Right, they go, it's our purpose statement. We kind of cracked it last year. It's over there on the wall. Oh, by the way, we went the extra yard and came up with three values to support it. 
Anyway, move on back to business as usual. And what I'm suggesting to you is there's a bit more to it than that. And so I'd just like to kind of unpack that and play that with you and encourage you as we're going through this time to kind of reflect on where are you from, right? So as, you, as you're exploring the ideas and the concepts we're going to be playing with here, I'd like you to keep reflecting back into where are we from, we being whoever's on top of your mind, right? It might be whanau, it might be organisation, it might be the uh, charity that you're part of, whatever it happens to be. So just keep using that as a touch point. The reason being, of course, is that every single culture on the planet is uniquely distinct, and so all I can talk about is generalizations. It's your job to convert those generalizations into realities. And uh, we'll unpack that a little bit more soon. So a really important way of kind of starting the conversation around culture is we often in anthropology refer to culture as the elusive obvious. And what we mean by that is it's a little bit like the white arrow in the FedEx logo. And I'm just going to pause there because I know not everybody in the room has a clue of what I'm talking about here. So how many can see the white arrow? Great, just point out to the, if you're sitting next to somebody who didn't put their hand up, can you just give them a nudge and show them what we're talking about? So in between the letter E and X, how many are going, oh, wow! <laughs> Already planning the next car trip with the kids, right? You can't wait to get stuck behind one of these vans and go, kids, I've got a great game for you now. All right. So here's my point. Do you get how the white arrow's been there the whole time, but some of us have seen that a gazillion times and never seen the white arrow before? I often find organizational cultures exactly the same thing. The culture's been sitting there the whole time, but while you've been busy with your Gantt charts and your project management and your brand positioning, right, and your financials and your spreadsheets, et cetera, this thing's actually been sitting there and is the very essence of what you're really all about, but you haven't taken the time or had the awareness to pay attention to it. If you think about what the arrow actually represents in FedEx, you get how it kind of gets to the core of what FedEx is all about. What better way to symbolise what FedEx is kind of there for? Its fundamental purpose is to get stuff from here to there fast. So the arrow is like the perfect symbol of that and almost expresses more about what FedEx is all about than the letters F-E-D-E-X. Does that make sense, guys? So culture is deeply, deeply symbolic. Culture operates as a living, breathing metaphor. And metaphors in terms of progress and velocity and momentum are incredibly powerful in culture. There's the old saying that we uh, talk about, a picture paints a thousand words. Well, a metaphor paints a thousand pictures. So a key thing that's vital you kind of do in an organization is find out what is your core metaphor in the culture. So once you know what your core metaphor in a culture is, it enables you to connect with people quicker, faster, deeper, and with more flexibility than trying to force your message on them. So it enables them to interpret what does the arrow mean in your world? What does an arrow symbolize to you? Where have you come across arrows? What is your arrow? Where are you trying to get to in your life or in your business or in your romance from here to here fast? I had to talk to my son about that recently. He's dating at the moment, trying to get from a certain place to a certain place fast. <laughs> often on the first date, and I said, steady on, mate. That's not cool anymore, right? You can get into a lot of trouble with that nowadays. So just slow it down and kind of bring more flowers in. So how do you start to literally see culture? How do you actually go into an environment and actually start to tune in? And for organizations, this is often something that is almost counterintuitive to how business people think. Because if you listen to the word organization itself, it's organized. So organizations are organized. That's what I meant by the team. We've got this team's organized to do that function. This team's organized to do that function. And we get so entrenched in that doing of that we often create things called silo mentalities. Have you heard of this phrase? Where the marketing team's at war with the sales team? Uh, we just heard it uh, kind of even in Google, that there's, right? Or Apple, there's one team over here saying, I think Jeremy was referencing, you know, you can choose blue in one company, you can't in another. So the benefit of understanding culture is culture basically is more universal than a team is. Teams belong to cultures. And so the more you can make that distinction of being aware of how to see culture and how it connects, the more flexibility and empowerment you empower your people with. So over many, many years, I've kind of tried different ways to teach non-business people how to think about culture and eventually settled on a pretty simple model, but I find it's a kind of useful way of looking at it. It's what we call the four A's. And the four A's basically are this, and you'll see, actually you won't see because the word's dropped over. We refer to uh, culture and anthropology not by calling it culture, but actually by referring to it as culturing. And I think this is an important thing to understand for business people as well, is culture, if you think of it, is almost like a noun, as I alluded to earlier. It's that stuff we did last year, 
that project, we finished, the board signed it off, we're happy, and now we're moving on. In reality, culture is a verb. Your organisational company culture starts fresh every single day. It starts from scratch every single day. Because the reality is, your company culture doesn't belong to your business, it belongs to who? People. So culture is human beings in action. So when your people go home at the end of a work shift, right, your culture goes with it. And if you're lucky, they'll bring it back with that same belief system, the same value system, the same symbolism, the same operating metaphor the next day and initiate it for you. So this model is a very, very simple model of starting to learn how to tune into culture. So the first thing we st recommend you start at kind of almost like the one o'clock, two o'clock position is start with awareness. Right. So if you're not aware of what culture is, where it comes from, how it forms, who leads culture, who owns culture, and you're trying to do work on your culture, you are already missing the plot. You're already missing the essence of what it's all about. And you're doing what we refer to as a cosmetic job. Right? So you'll come up with the purpose statement or the set of values, and they're useful, they're absolutely relevant, but they need to be embedded into something deeper than that in order for them to be authentic and real and add a real resonance to what you're talking about. So we key starting point is be aware of what culture is. Once you've got that under your belt, you can move into phase two, which is starting to appreciate, so where does culture play a role in our business? Where is it relevant? Where is it adding value? Where is it sabotaging value? Where is it enabling collaboration or separation? So you start to now see how it's playing out in your world. Once you've got that, you can then start to see what action might be needed to be taken on culture or with culture. So think of it as a graphic equaliser. Where can we dial up and dial down where culture is impacting on the business? And then obviously you start to look at and what is that achieving for us? Is that retaining talent more than before? Is it enabling greater cross-functional learning? Is it giving us a connection to consumers that wasn't there before? Whereas before our brand was promising something, the culture is actually making or breaking that promise. Right, so it's an important distinction. We go off with brands and promise something and expectation to the marketplace, and we've all had this experience, haven't we? When you actually connect with the organisation, the culture then is in action. That brand promise gets kept or broken. So that's the achievement element we can start to play with as well. So if you take nothing else from this whole talk, other than just that model alone, to go away and have a think about and reflect on, a really good question is just play amateur anthropologist for a month in your business and just see how aware is your business of culture in action. Does it get mentioned? Does it get referred to? Does it get considered? Does it get appreciated? Or is it just, as we saw before, the elusive obvious? And increasingly what you're going to find is the uh, younger generation, right? So by that I mean kind of the working force, anybody under the age of 35 is more invested in your company culture than they are in their pay packet. Right, so if it's not working for them, they're automatically looking for elsewhere. So I want you, especially if you're kind of my age, right, I want you to factor in this for those younger workers. Culture for the younger workforce is a currency. It's a social currency. So they feel they're getting paid as much through the culture, the, the friendship, the learning, the laughter, the encouragement, the support, as they do in the wage packet. It's as important to them and usually far more, more important to them than the money they're getting paid, which is why we see those younger generations quite happy doing interns work, right? doing six, nine months work, hard labor, using their intelligence, their passion, their courage, their commitment, their creativity for absolute free. Why? Want to be part of that feeling. So this is kind of really sort of gets to be quite deep stuff. I often get asked by the media, is this kind of emphasis on culture? It's just the latest business trend. And my response is actually no, other way around. Business is the latest cultural trend. Our species has been culturing since the year dot, right? It's our A game. It's the thing we do better than other, any other species on the planet. It's why we are the dominant species. Everyone thinks it's about intelligence. It's actually the use of intelligence collectively that's got it to where we are. So business is a culturing game, not the other way around. Right? And I'll start to show you how that sort of plays out in terms of how this all works. So the awareness is the bit I want to kind of spend the rest of the time on just with you is take you kind of just starting to open up that perspective of awareness of culture. Are you up for that? Two of you are? All right, the rest, just, just in your comfort, when you're ready, thank you those two that responded. The rest of you just ask them when you're ready. And so what we're going to do is kind of play with that old metaphor, right, that we don't know who discovered water, we just know damn sure it wasn't a fish. Often when you're in a culture, it's really, really, really hard to see it, right? So even in anthropology, they recommend you never do anthropology on your own tribe, right? 
because you're biased before you even get started. You're bringing the wrong mechanisms, the wrong thought, the wrong perspective into the environment. So what I'd like to do is just uh, provide an opportunity for you. If we're going to use an understanding of culture and you're trying to grow a business from New Zealand, how do we become aware of New Zealand culture? How do we become potentially a little bit more aware of what are we actually taking out there in the first place? In other words, where are we coming from? Not, are we go not what are we going there for? We already know that, right? It's growth, market share, revenue, spread the good word, whatever it happens to be. This is more about, cool, got that, where are you coming from? So I've taken the liberty of just kind of starting at a really simplistic level of some of the really core symbolisms that operate in Aotearoa uh, to give us an indication of what's going on with culture. So I'm just going to put these up on the screen, going to leave them up there for about 10 seconds. I'm actually not going to say anything because I'd like you to kind of get engaged. And what we're looking for, I'm going to show you three slides with very commonly understood and recognised symbols from New Zealand. What I'd like you to do is kind of look at each one and just see if you can see any patterns emerging about what these things are all pointing to at a deeper level. Let's say this can be challenging if you're on from New Zealand, right? Because it's, you're in the water already. And often we find people, we've got a lot of uh, friends and family here from the United States. Often the external people will pick up on it even quicker. So here's the first one. So again, we're just looking for patterns. What are these things got in common? Here's the second one. Here's the third one. So I'm just going to reverse those again a little bit. And we could have gone on for hours on this, right? There are slide after slide after slide of this. But has anyone kind of spotted the pattern already that you feel confident you've seen what it's all about? All right, cool, that's fine. So let me just take you on a bit of a guided tour. I'm going to do this fairly quickly. The kind of thing here is that we're looking for is New Zealand symbolism is all about what's underneath, right? So our national colour is black. We're the only country in the world that has black, right, as its national colour, which of course is the shadow colour. We, our, our bird, our national bird can't fly. Right? and spends its whole visual focus is down, not up. Right? We have uh, volcanic activity under the ground. Our national anthem talks about being at the feet, not looking God in the eye and, and demanding or expressing, etc. And we have the Southern Cross, not anything Northern right on there, but in terms of that reference from escaping from. We have the waka, and this can be the waka as in Pakiha waka, which is the vessels that the immigrants came out on or the indigenous arrivals here as well. Both of those uh, communities both in the waka and in the ships that came out here, spend a lot of time concentrating on underneath. So in Polynesian navigation, the uh, navigation finding New Zealand, or if you're familiar with Maui fishing up the North Island, that metaphor, that mythology comes out of the fact that the wayfinder, the trance maker, would sit at the front of the waka, go into trance and concentrate on the underlying currents of the water to determine where land was sitting. It is the equivalent of radar. It is a form of genius where you can sit in a waka through the wood, right? Feel the underlying deep currents that are at play and pick out there's a breakup in the current pattern here, which must mean that lands over there. So the wayfinder would say that way, right? Everyone else on board that hadn't been brought up with that tradition would go, how on earth did they do that? And so hence the mythology of it being pulled, the land being pulled out of the water because suddenly we see Aotearoa arise out of. The land itself, Aotearoa, land under the white cloud, the silver fern, get this, this blew me away because I'm not originally from New Zealand, blew me away when I first arrived in the country and the national symbol was the underside of a leaf. I was born in England where they had the rose fairly up front and predominant. I got raised in Africa, so we've got things like in South Africa with the protea, the Canadian maple. Normally they're kind of big, bold emblems, right? Not New Zealand, nah, nah, we're going underneath, mate. That's what's really important here. <laughs> Just settle it down. You with your big bright rose and your protea, settle it down. We're going, not, we don't even want the flower, we want the leaf, right? And it's not only the leaf, we want the underneath of the leaf, right? <laughs> The Pākehā arrival here, it was the second eldest that came to New Zealand, not the first. The first aid in England inherited the land, right? The third went off to the uh, priesthood, right? It was the second ones that got posted in colonial positions. So even then, we didn't want tall people. We wanted the second tier, hence tall poppy syndrome. So we get some really kind of powerful Im images serving out here. If we go on to the next one, the haka, 
right? And for those of the uh, our American friends arrived ahead of uh, Pofli last night and actually got to experience that. It's a powerful expression. The Kamate Hacker, if you listen to it, is Kamate Hacker is all about coming out of the Kumra pit from underneath to refine yourself, to reestablish yourself, to reclaim yourself. The colloquialism in New Zealand, yeah, nah. Yeah, nah. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm in, but nah, not really. <laughs> So we had this kind of really interesting phenomenon going on. We had Rutherford, who kind of only Rutherford, right, could have gone to the very core of what life's all about in the atoms, who's involved there. This fellow up here knocked off the biggest mountain in the world. What did he say? What was the expression he said once they'd done it? We knocked the bastard off, right? Off. We cut it down to size. Not, did you check how awesome we are as mountaineers because we made it to the top? That would have been an English statement, right? Kiwi's going, yeah, we knocked it off, mate. Brought it back down to size. Tall poppy syndrome, as I alluded to earlier, and then we refer to ourselves as being at the bottom of the world, right? So there's this massive emphasis, and that's just a tipping point. You become aware of where, where are we coming from underneath, right? So we have this sort of pioneering drive to, to drive us to get back on top. It's why uh, our kind of universal graduation ceremony in this country is the OE, right? It's more value than an MBA. Or a PhD is going, yeah, but have you been overseas yet? I know you're smart, but have you been overseas? Right, because otherwise you're smart here. Right, and there's more to it than that. That makes sense, guys? So what is that telling us all? Well, it's something you just kind of be aware of. And every kind of culture has this. It operates out of what's called the core belief system. So the core belief system in New Zealand is it's underneath that counts, not what the surface level it's authenticity that counts in this country. It's the real that counts in this country, not the showing off, not the glamorous, not the impression, right? We wanna know who are you really underneath and then we'll do business. There's a reason why New Zealand got the first trade agreement with China after thousands of countries have tried. And by thousands of countries, I mean some of them are alive today, some of them before. Marco Polo tried to get a free trade agreement with China and they turned him down, right? They ended up trading, but they couldn't get a free trade agreement. New Zealand did. Why is that possible? Because we're the first nation to turn up humble. Right? So we turned up to China and went, g'day, how are you? We're from New Zealand, you won't have heard of us, you've probably heard of Australia, our neighbours, because we're so small. We are humbled to be here, China is an ancient culture, it's massive and we believe we've got a lot to learn, we'd love to trade with you. Right? Chinese went, choice. <laughs> At last, somebody's arrived and acknowledged who we are and what we're all about. Other nations arrived and said, hi. Sorry, I'll try not to do an accent so I don't give away who that was. <laughs> turned up and said, hi. We're super impressive, you may have heard of us, we've got a massive economy, bigger than yours by the way. Also, we've uh, been invested in capitalism, I understand you went with the other form, so we're here to educate you, drag you into the 21st century, and they went, yeah. So this is really powerful. Unfortunately, there's a flip side to this. Have you noticed how proud Kiwis are of being humble? <laughs> right, so humble's good until you get overseas, and that can become a bit of a cultural paradox for us, right? You can't necessarily just play the humble card overseas because the overseas see straight through it and go, yeah, you're particularly proud of this humility thing. What's going on there? Have you seen the paradox? Have you lay on the couch and had that analyzed? Where's that coming from? And we built stories around this, right? We build hero worship around this stuff, right? And so what happens is we created what's called tall poppy syndrome, right? Which be good, but don't be too good because then you're getting ahead of yourself. And at the same time, we've got the opposite, right? Which is go deep, which is the number eight fencing wire. So within our culture, we've got this kind of like deep thinking, insight, innovative, intuitive, right? And at the top end, we've got this kind of really introverted, isolated, don't get out, don't step out of the boundaries. So understanding that about yourself becomes very, very important when you're sharing your, with yourself, with people overseas, markets overseas, trying to attract employees overseas, is helping them understand where are you coming from on top of what are we here for, which is the team building. So I just wanna show you kind of the architecture of how that works. And this is what we refer to as cultural formation. All cultures in the world start with belief. You know you're dealing with a really powerful culture when they can define what their core belief is. I don't know if you noticed when Jeremy was referring earlier to the early days of Icebreaker, he used a phrase just up on stage here a matter of minutes ago, and he said, Icebreaker believes in the power of nature. Did you hear that? That's compelling. Because then the moment anybody from Icebreaker starts talking about their product and why they do what they do and why they've taken on the status quo of synthetic versus it's coming out of the belief we believe in the power of nature. Now you can go anywhere in the world and talk to any culture on the planet and go, power of nature, right? Guess what they're gonna say? Yep, seen that. The storms, the fires, the floods, the sunlight, the growth. Do you get the idea? So we're in, 
It's deep, it's real, we can commit already. So we will listen now to the icebreaker story because it's come from deep, deep, deep down at a human level that we can connect to. So then everything else becomes believable. So the belief bit's very, very important. All cultures start with belief. Second level, of course, is all our beliefs influence our behaviors. So what we believe influences how we behave. How we behave dictates over time who we become, what we kind of isolate into. And so that circle, if you like, becomes the cultural circumference. All cultures are a social immune system, right? So once we've clarified what our belief, behave, become model is about ourselves, we typically will defend it often to the death, right? So anything that doesn't fit in, we will hold off and keep at bay. Right? And that can be really, really powerful from point from brand integrity. But the key thing I want to share with you here is that the benefit of this believing, behaving, and becoming is really, really powerful in the marketplace now because people are in search of, and especially this young generation, they're desperately in search of authenticity. So the deeper you can go in terms of articulating and capturing what you're fundamentally all about, the more likely people are to enjoy you being here. Right? If it's just at the surface level, we're just here to do this, right? They kind of go, yes, so is everyone else. If you can articulate and describe where that's coming from, what motivated, what's the intent behind it, you can see increasingly that that becomes a powerful offering. People get intrigued. They become compelled about your story and what's going on here. So if you kind of look at your businesses in terms of what do we believe, then start to understand how does that, or should that be influencing our behaviors and will that enable us to achieve the aspirations what we're aiming for? You are starting to integrate culture into your business. And once you do that, you have a competitive advantage and here's why. Culture only does one thing, delivers performance. Strategy directs performance, culture delivers it. And culture starts first. So culture is delivering performance constantly on a daily basis. Your strategy says, hey, thanks for that performance. That looks really amazing. We're going to use it to direct growth in this marketplace. So the connection between culture and strategy is vital because the common ground is the performance. Now, final tip on this, because there's a almost a bias, if you like, to a lot of cultures favor their own, and Kiwis can be guilty of this as well. When you're building a business overseas, it's tempting to think that you want to extrapolate and take Kiwis from New Zealand and go plant them in San Francisco or Tokyo or Cologne or London. And what I would suggest to you is it's actually quite useful to embrace the locals. Because what we want to do, if you look at the shape of what we're talking about here, is we want to actually ensure that we're creating what we call positive deviance. So positive deviants are at the level of behaving, we want to learn from others how to behave our belief system in this locality. So how you behave polite in Japan, do you get how that's different than how you believe, uh, behave polite in Ponsonby? Is that a fair comment? So often when you go into another culture, you bring your belief system as we believe in polite, right? But at the same time, you want to look for what we call positive deviance, which is show us how to do that here in Tokyo, right? Because back on the farm in New Zealand, right, it was slightly different. This bowing thing really freaks us out, right? So be strong in your beliefs, be flexible in your behaviors and be aspirational in who you become. And how you do that is by connecting your beliefs through a set of values. Uh, a number of the speakers that we've heard this morning have been referring to this. So understand what you believe in and then capture those as a set of values. Those values then should inspire the behaviors that you have as a culture. And those behaviors, the ones that work for you and deliver results for you should become habitual over and over and over again. So it reinforces and cements who you become. When you get it right, what you end up with, as I alluded to earlier, is a real authenticity. And there's a bunch of brands I've got to throw up here, even that are in the room today. But let's just use the icebreaker one because we referred to it earlier when Jeremy said, when we know that icebreaker believes in the power of nature, right? That's what we call in culture undeniable. If a brand turns around and says, we're here for good, that's deniable. Agreed? You can go, you really? Or is it profit? But if you go to a belief system that says, we believe in the power of nature. That is undeniable. Nature is powerful. So knowing what your core belief is enables you to actually understand how to build the narrative, the story, and this is the key word, with integrity. Integrity is often a misunderstood word as well in business. Integrity often gets referred to as honesty. It doesn't. The original word for integrity was integrous, which means fully integrated across the three levels. And once you get that, the three levels of believing, behaving, and becoming, you create culture. 
And my kind of clo closing words on this is the word culture, again, often misunderstood, comes from the word, the Latin word cultus, which means to care. So if you want to know what culture actually is about at its fundamental level is, this is what we care about, which is the belief. This is how much we care about it, which is the behave. And this is how we prove it in the world, which is what we become. So what do you believe in? How much do you care about what you believe in? And how do you prove that in the world? How do you make that undeniable to the marketplace, to your investors, to your employees? So if you're going to use that as a formula, and I wish you all the very best. I love the Kiwi kind of pioneering is reversing the boats, right? We all came here from somewhere originally. We're now going choice, let's take it back out. I love that, and so I wish you all the very best, but here's my kind of closing recommendation. Be strong in your beliefs. Identify what they are, own them. Build turanga waiwai on your beliefs. Think about what you aspire to become. Be bold in that. The get rid of tall poppy syndrome. Go big and hold big, because the world is big. The world believes in big. It's just in New Zealand we've bought into this belief that we can't do that, so you need to get over that. So think about four times bigger than you're already planning, right? just to get to twice as good as you're already planning. So have that motivation, have that aspiration, have that belief that that's going to happen anyway. But be flexible in your behaviours because being Kiwi overseas doesn't work all the time, right? Humble doesn't work in New York. People think you've got a self-esteem problem, <laughs> right? So we're proud of humble here, it doesn't work so well overseas. Thank you all, kia kaha. Awesome. It's uh, such a, it really goes to the heart of business, right? Mm. So um, when we go to you at the slide that you had before, Michael, belief, behave, do you want that become. Back? Yeah. Can we do be, that, guys? It'd be quite helpful, actually, because there's kind of so much in that. Um, yeah, there you go. Let's just stop there. So for the last few summits, we've heard from businesses, and this has probably started, I don't know, six or seven years ago. Actually, after Simon Sinek started talking about how important, you know, why was. Everyone knows what you do, they want to know why you do it. And at the same time, companies started talking about purpose. You've got to find your purpose, yeah. the role of purpose. And we've already heard that two or three times, actually from every speaker today. So does purpose live in this belief thing? Is this why purpose and that stuff is important? Or how, how does that fit into this framework? Yeah, good question. I'm just going to make some distinctions in there. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, this is going to sound like I'm challenging Simon's kind of work. I'm absolutely not. He's a fellow anthropologist, so he's got a degree in anthropology, applied it in marketing. So I'm kind of in awe of the guy. Um, having said that, purpose kind of sits at the lot, top level. It's what you want to become. So if you were going to put a word across the top of the become, like over the top of the circumference, you would put purpose. Like what do you want to become and how does that connect? Belief is actually perspective. So what I would suggest to you is, in order for a why to be real, you first need to know who. Mm. So to be able to walk the talk of the why, you need to know who you are. You need to know your heritage, your narrative, your DNA, your genesis, because otherwise you can get manipulated or uh, distracted in terms of the purpose, right? Mm. And, and why you're doing it can be for, uh, irrational, illogical, heck, even the legal reasons. And we've seen that uh, the law societies, uh, law, law companies in New Zealand have been through that recently. The uh, financial sector in Australia has been through it. Their purpose, you go and read them, they're bold and uh, inspiring, right? But then you go and look at who they are while they're doing that, and they're racist, sexist bullies, right? <laughs> so you go, well, well hang on a minute. Big clients of yours. Yeah, a few of them, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, difference between who and why. Okay. Um, and where does... <laughs> I know, conversation stopper. <laughs> uh, and ideas like values, right? Mm. Values are what we're told, values guide behaviour. Where do, where do values sit in your framework? They're the, uh, that first line up above beliefs. So values define behaviour if you don't understand what beliefs are. So in other words, uh, what I would suggest to you is values actually don't guide behavior at all, beliefs do. Values articulate the behavior. 
So values give you some language to describe the underlying need or the driver or the inclination or the intention. So the actual behavior itself is absolutely unquestionably coming out of a belief system. But to be able to explain that, articulate it or rationalize it or even um, defend it with other people, you need, you need to find some language. And so values become a convenient way of languaging that belief. And we do a lot of work in this space in, in a subset of anthropology called axiology. So there's 128 known human values from cultures all around the world. And you can take any one of those 128 and go into any language anywhere in the world and you find there's a subset at work in that language of how those people have chosen to be human there at that time. Remind me not to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and you talked about metaphors and there are cultural metaphors and metaphors that people create mm. about their own business. So mm. let's go back to some cultural metaphors. Um, blokes and sheds. Yeah. So we were told to celebrate that as kids because it was, you know, where genius happened. Um, but when we were talking, it was like it's a metaphor of being isolationist. Yeah. You know, the, the, the dark side of number eight wire is being under-resourced. Mm. Um, uh, she'll be right, you know, it's still a short and a buck late yeah. often. So some of these founding kind of mythologies, do you need to shake them off sometimes? Or do you just look on the good side of these things? No, they, they need to evolve. You've got to honour them for what they were at the time they were. Um, so when you were isolated, and in our case, uh, separated from the outlying cultures that we came from, so even uh, Māori were uh, arriving here, were on the outskirts of the cultures they were leaving. Same with the Pākehā arriving here. So there's a reason why that isolation thing became real and became powerful and, and very influential. But to your point, in a global world where we're now uh, encouraged to send the walkers back, that doesn't serve us anymore. So the really important thing is to keep evolving the metaphors that the culture is operating from to suit the times and your aspirations and the world we kind of live in. And you said um, metaphors paint a thousand pictures. Mm. So they're important. Can they be created within companies? Uh, do they exist in books or through language? How have you found companies using metaphors powerfully to communicate with their people or with their customers? I think both. Um, the conversation's largely been led by design and creative agencies. So now we've got a number of speakers coming to be able to talk to us about that. So I can't wait for that to kind of listen in. But uh, both internally and externally, or in anthropology, we call it emikinetic. So that there's an inside and an outside link between metaphors. And metaphors literally build a bridge from kind of left brain to right brain, if you like. So from the thinking and the strategizing to actual connection in the real world. And they're powerful because they work very, very quickly. So if somebody understands the metaphor of, say, a bridge, and they just used a bridge. So if you've all experienced a bridge, crossed a bridge, celebrated a bridge, you automatically can start to unfold stories at a rapid rate compared to if I had to draw your model of how to build a bridge, which takes time. Uh, maybe it needs expertise and capabilities. So metaphors are a very, very powerful way of connecting to market and connecting employees to purpose and strategy and brand. So I think, yeah, just I almost think it's one of the uber skills of leadership in the 21st century is going to be mastering metaphors. And I remember when I was studying, um, you know, when I was 18 or 19, uh, I got very excited. There was an anthropologist called Grant McCracken ah, who had yeah, an yeah, idea yeah. called self-image congruence and it said something like um, people bring objects into their life that are congruent that are aligned with their self-image so how much uh, so so kind of flipping this conversation outside of culture to culture in a bigger sense yeah. culture of a community yeah. that buy and sell stuff consume and also dispose what's what sort of lens and firstly, what are your thoughts about the self-image congruence? And secondly, what sort of lens we should, should we be looking at, not internal culture, but in terms of how we consider our customers and our markets? I think, um, and Tina actually mentioned this, so I complimented on it actually, because I thought it was really sort of powerful insight from her talk this morning. I think the new lens or the emerging lens is human consciousness. 
So uh, I respect the work that you're referring to in anthropology was around that kind of self-reflection and internal identity. I think there's been a transition, thankfully, uh, after centuries of it not being that way, where we're starting to realise we actually really are global citizens, that there is something kind of precious going on here, that being alive kind of is a privilege rather than just an opportunity. And because of that, I think we're starting to see a shift in what I refer to as consciousness. So we can think of that, if that sounds a bit woo-woo or hippie for you, kind of a, a, a broadening of the awareness of what we're all about, what makes us us, and what opportunities there are to connect with objects, products, language, cultures, to play with that, explore that, and uh, evolve ourselves. So... And it's interesting, you know, coming from New Zealand, we have to build international markets, right? And the US is very different from, you know, winning in the East Coast is different from winning in the West Coast even, or versus, you know, Canada or Germany or wherever. Um, when we think about um, building international markets, should we be thinking about the values we have which are maybe common to markets, or should we be thinking about the cultural nuance of the East Coast versus Canada yeah. or something like that? I think it's the marriage between the two. So again, hold on to what you believe, but that's why I say be flexible with your behaviour. So if you believe in quality, right, uh, what quality might look like in New York could be different from what quality looks like in San Francisco. And so that doesn't mean we're surrendering our commitment to quality, but it means we might use different language. It might mean we position products differently. We might build narrative around the product differently in New York than we do in San Francisco in order for us to become successful in the United States. So yeah, it's back to that model. It's, it's kind of keep the bottom half tight um, or the top end tight in terms of what you actually want to achieve and become. And Brian was even suggesting that may change every two to three years or even faster if the strategy suddenly becomes redundant. But allow for a massive amount of breadth and learning and flexibility in the middle space. So I often refer to the middle, the behavior space as uh, freedom in a framework. So you have parameters of, you know, we don't want any behavior to be illegal or uh, inappropriate. But within that, we're willing to watch you behave and learn because that's where we may get breakthroughs or understanding or a deeper and better connection to the customer than we brought with us from New Zealand because we don't understand that's what the customer yeah, wants. Yeah, which was very much the kind of premise behind Jerry's talk. Yeah, Find right. out who's engaged with you and yeah. also a premise behind uh, Tina's talk in terms of how do we you know, build communities around you know, a set of values or a set of beliefs as opposed to just around products. What we want to become, right? Yeah. Products and services. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much, My Michael, for My bringing that together for Thank us. you. Thank you.